All right, so uh, welcome, family, to our professional development training for the week. And uh, this week's topic is Autism Spectrum Disorder. So it's a, a teacher's guide and workshop presentation. And it's gonna it's designed for um, teaching. It's designed for teachers, but um, also, you know, a behaviorist, child study team, anybody who really um, works with students um, with autism spectrum disorder. So uh, this is a, a, a broad presentation, but it, it, it does go in depth on teaching strategies and the disability, causes of the disability. It's, uh, I don't know how many slides, uh, I think about 75 slides or something like, like that, but it, it, it is an in-depth training. And uh, let's dive right into it. Um, here we go. And uh, first off here, this is a, a video that, that I created um, which uh, is, is an overview, let's say. I think it's about a 10-minute video. It's a whiteboard animation, and I'll link it. Um, I'll link it in this presentation as well. And many of the images and slides from this uh, video uh, are are used in this presentation. So this video right here, if you take a look here, I, I do uh, risks, diagnosis, collaborations. Many of of these images are placed right into this video. Okay. So let's let's get going. And before I really get into it too, um, let me just mention um. Again, um, you know, I'll provide some links in the information and, and in the description for uh, this PowerPoint presentation or this Google Slides presentation if you want to use it. And with all my presentations, you know, I want to say thank you for coming here. Uh, you know, everybody who's here trying to learn this is, is becoming better as an educator. And it's only going to help out students and, and things like that. And uh, lastly, uh, you know, if you have any questions or, or, or things like that, just put it in the description as well. So let's get right into it here, and let's get ready to, to, to learn as much as you can about uh, teaching these students. So uh, first off, uh, children with autism spectrum disorder, and uh, it's pronounced ASD in education. Uh, you know, we always have acronyms in education, IEP, ASD, uh, the list is endless. Um, so uh, children with autism spectrum disorder are most recognizable by difficulties in communicating with others. And you know, I've, at first, before I was into teaching, you know, I, I had an idea of what autism is, but I didn't really understand that it was a, basically a communication disorder, okay? Uh, another important fact here is autism spectrum is much more common in boys, and uh, ASD is at least four times more common in boys than girls, so that's a big number, okay? That, that's a very big number. Let's go here. All right, so here's our introduction. Um, children with ASD exhibit repetitive behaviors and have common communication and social interaction difficulties. Again, social interaction and communication difficulties. So it's four times more common in boys. Uh, it does affect all ethnic groups. Uh, symptoms start to occur at, at two years of age. It has a range of different disorders. Uh, many students go through ABA therapy, and um, you know it's a spectrum now. Okay, and we'll get into why it, it changed from autism to a spectrum. So there's a lot to cover here. This is an important presentation. So uh, symptoms of ASD can appear before the age of two. However, ASD is usually not diagnosed until at least the age of two, until at least the age of two. And many children are actually diagnosed after the age of three. So, you know, two to one, two to three, that's where your diagnosis happens. Um, you know, there are fluctuations. Now, ASD affects all ethnic, social, economic groups. It's not targeted at one specific group. Now, although all these different groups are affected, there are discrepancies within those groups uh, with respect to ASD diagnosis. Okay? Um, so, you know, we'll get into that too as, as this goes on. ABA therapy, uh, you know, uh, applied behavior analysis is often used to help modify the detrimental behaviors of these students. And many ASD children, um, you know, have their own ABA therapists or schools uh, nowadays are hiring more ABA therapists. ABA is currently uh, being incorporated in schools throughout the United States and the number of ABA therapists working in schools is continually on the rise. So ABA is a research-based approach, okay? Applied behavior, so you hear the word applied and analysis. Okay, here's a, another video I put together. Um, this one I'm very proud of. This took me, to make this video, this took me a very long time. Um, applied behavior, this talks about an introduction and some of the actual strategies used. And I'm going to go over this as well, such as fading, extinction, um, 
uh, functional behavioral assessment. This really goes into details. Again, this will be uh, linked in the presentation. But, uh, you know, we don't have time to watch it now because I want to get through and, and, and get through everything here. So the autism spectrum uh, describes a range of complex developmental disorders that are thought to be caused by deficits in brain development. Complications in the nervous system are linked to autism. Autism disorder is just one type of ASD, but it's considered a spectrum because it has a wide variation in severity, okay? So, you know, you have high-functioning ASD and then you have low-functioning, so that's why it's called a spectrum, all right? And, again, it's there's a wide variation in severity of autism uh, disorder. So, like, like I said, uh, you know, it is a communication disorder, so some will be able to communicate better than others, and some won't be able to communicate at all. So that's why it's a spectrum. So uh, the disorder types within ASD, okay? So it's your, it was began with your basic autistic uh, disorder, Asperger's, atypical PD, uh, PDD, NOS. We'll get into, we're gonna get into all these. Um, Rett syndrome is not now, is is now not considered a, a form of ASD, although it was at one point. Uh, childhood disintegrative disorder uh, is, um, you know, these are the disorder types. So we're going to explore these now in, in this section here. So the first disorder that I described is autistic disorder. Uh, this was the older term before it was replaced with autism spectrum disorder. The next disorder, Asperger's, is a mild form of ASD. Okay, Asperger's is, remember, it's a spectrum where children may have high levels of intelligence and can handle daily tasks. Continuing, another disorder is a PDD-NOS, which stands for Pervasive Developmental Disorder Not Otherwise Specified. And that disorder, PDD-NOS, is sometimes described as atypical autism. Okay, so that's like the slang term. Okay, PDD-NOS autism characteristics are more intense than Asperger's, but less intense than autistic disorder. So again, this, again, right, we keep going back to the spectrum, okay? Rett syndrome was once, was a category of ASD, but now has been removed. Children must meet new diagnostic criteria. Rett's mostly affects girls and is very rare and severe. The last category is CDD, which is childhood disintegrative disorder. And uh, that disorder is most severe is the most severe form of autism on the spectrum. Children uh, rapidly deteriorate and may develop intense seizures. Uh, this is very serious. And you know, we know we have CDD at one end of the spectrum, and then we've got Asperger's, which is like very high functioning at the other end of the spectrum. And you really should get to, to you know get to you know if you're teaching students with ASD, you need to know you know where they are in the spectrum. And, and you will be able to tell just by, I mean, you know, just by working on them, you should be able to tell as well. Okay, causes and risks. So one of the causes and, and, and specific causes, and, and this is the most important thing, that's why I put it in red. The specific causes of ASD are unknown. These are potential causes, okay? Um, we do know that, that, that you know, um, the age of a parent has an effect, uh, you know, it's mutations in the genes, Pre, you know, uh, certain types of medication. Currently, there are no links to vaccines. However, you know, one of my professors in college who, who I have tremendous respect for and is doing a lot of research with ASD is uh, constantly putting out content and, and you know, and research, uh, you know, publicized research, show, you know, saying he, uh, you know, showing correlations, let's say, between the vaccines and, and, and you know, students with ASD. But I, I, at this point, I can't say that there's definitive uh, research of linked from ASD to vaccines. It's it's not there yet. I'm not saying it won't be. Um, other potential causes, and, and these are risk factors as well, uh, metallic pollution. We're going to get into all of these. So, all right, so what are some causes and risk fa factors for ASD? Now, the specific causes of ASD are unknown. However, however, scientists have identified some potential risk factors. Uh, there is currently research that strongly implies a genetic component is involved. Scientists are now able to focus their study of genetics onto just a few alleles and their mutations within the gene. However, further research is needed for definitive answers. But science is certainly heading in the right direction. So we keep studying this, okay? Uh, we need more research. Uh, there has been much debate about vaccines and autism. 
So that's what I was talking about. Science says the research, uh, scientists say the research is definitive that there is no link between autism and vaccine. Others believe differently. Uh, you know, right now, the research is definitive, but I don't know what it's going to be in 10 years, okay? A potential risk, risk factor is the age of the parents, okay? Uh, my doctor has, has mentioned that to me several times. Um, the risk of autism increases as the age of the parents increase. This is directly proportional. So, you know, directly proportional, you know, as, as one, um, directly proportional, if I were to draw a graph out for you, with an x and y axis so as you have an increase in one you have an increase in the other so it's kind of like just like a solid line going right through so as the parents get older the risk of asd in the child gets older and based on recent study uh babies that are very that are, are that are born very prematurely I'm talking about preterm babies also have a high risk of autism more risk factors include air pollution which is uh, exposure during pregnancy these are risk factors okay um, the type of air pollution described is that it's high in metal content. And there have been some claims out there about the specific medications during pregnancy as a risk factor. Again, those are claims, but have not yet been substantiated. So if we go back to this thing, causes and risks, you know, I know I have this there, I, I you know, with the medicine thing. I, again, if you read here, these are claims, but they really haven't been substantiated. Let's move on to the next topic. And uh, give me a second. I just... I'm going to be back in one second. I forgot to charge my computer, so i got to grab this wire. All right, I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. I hope you didn't leave. I almost knocked over my candle. i got a little candle here. It's, uh, damn. It's hot though. Cinnamon, cinnamon clove. Let's knock it over. I like to have the candle to the side. It's like very relaxing for these presentations. Okay. All right. Diagnosis. Um. All right. So this, this is a uh, this, this right here is an infographic that I created from an earlier video, and I'm just gonna break it down in 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 the slides. So uh, the specific measures for diagnosis of children with autism are broken down into two levels. All right, so let's talk about level one. Is So we're talking about diagnosing children for ASD. I'm going to focus on level one. Level one is initial screening, which is carried out by general practitioners. Doctors. Children that fail level one's initial screening go on to level two. Level two, children get a more detailed evaluation from experts within the field of autism. Diagnosis in level two is meant for permanent record. Early detection of ASD, and we mentioned this earlier, early detection is 18 to 24 months. So like one and a half is, is, is very early. But full diagnosis is usually at age three or above. Um, I know I said one, two to three, there are times it's above. Evaluation and assessments are conducted using neurodevelopmental frameworks. The frameworks include the child's. Uh, the frameworks include the child's family, teachers, professional. It's a multidisciplinary team. Multidisciplinary team. That means you want to get as many people from you know different backgrounds involved. Excuse me. I'm a sip of coffee here. Okay. So again, talking about diagnosis, right? ASD is difficult to diagnose because there's no straightforward medical test, like blood tests, right? Think about a blood test. You know, you could take a blood test, you know, they pull out that needle, stick you with that needle, and, you know, take the draw of the blood, and then you know if you, and then you know if you're positive or negative. With diagnosis with ASD, it's not a blood test. You know, it, it's it's from observation. So many parents report long waiting lists when it comes to getting an appointment for an evaluation. This is very important. Um, that is why early intervention is important as well. You, you as, as a parent, you've got to be on top of these things. Doctors must look at developmental history and communication. ASD has a diverse list of symptoms, which include delayed speech, no eye contact. These are, again, I, I'm not to say... I, everything here is important, but I keep stressing this is also important. 
you know, lack of response, poor social skills, atypical tone, withdrawal, self-abuse, repetitive behaviors. And we're going to get a little more into all of these. So we talked about the different, you know, we talked about the spectrum, the causes, diagnosis. Now it's time to get into like, you know, the field of education, let's say, right? Early intervention. Research has proven the effectiveness of early intervention services. Okay. It informs the, early intervention should inform the parents. It should have be outcome-oriented frameworks. So it should focus on results. It should also focus on the basics, have curriculum-based measures. And, you know, we'll get into all of this. All right, this is our next topic right here, early intervention. Research has proven the effectiveness of early intervention services for s children with autism spectrum disorder. And, you know, the research is definitive because, you know, you know, a lot of legis a lot of special education legislation has put money out for early intervention because the research is definitive that, you know, getting, you know, children with disabilities early intervention really makes a difference, uh, you know, compared to those that don't get early intervention. So if they're putting money to it, if the government's putting money into it, you know, you can be sure that there's some research backing that up. All right. The services being with informing the parent of everything. All right. So we went back here, inform the parents and build positive relationships with the parents. It's, ne you know, parents of ASD children, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to, to say the least. And you want to form positive relationship. You want always, you always want parents as an ally to begin with. Uh, but, you know, positive relationships go such a long way. Early intervention works best when parents trust the child's educators. And as I'm going to get into it, honesty is always the best policy in trust. Don't ever lie to a parent of one of your students. Ongoing assessments and evaluations are necessary. Assessments should be used to determine the right frequency and right intensity of services. Right? Uh, some children may need more services than others. You want to make sure those that need it get the right intensity and, and those that maybe don't need it as much don't get too much intensity that they're held back all right you want to have you want to match you want to have the, the you want to have the the right intensity to match the severity of asd at first these services must focus on the basics helping students express themselves have students following and responding to directions building communication skills ASD children should spend as much time as possible with their peers. Social interaction is an integral part of early intervention. There will be difficult times ahead for some students as they begin to better socialize, but these difficult times are needed to help ASD children develop and grow. And, that, and that's the whole point of this whole thing, right? We want to help these children develop and grow. Curriculum-based assessments are used as a direct method to evaluate target skills children need to master. So a curriculum-based assessment would be, um, you know, is the child able to um, complete his times tables up to 10? Okay, and then, you know, if that's what's being taught in the classroom and part of the curriculum, then you're going to assess that. Outcome-oriented, and I keep, I don't know if I'm trying to pr pr pronounce this right, outcome-oriented frameworks are also used to set up specific target skills, goals, and objectives. So the framework are the frameworks are used to set up. The framework is the plan to set up, uh, you know, uh, uh, the goals and target skills that you want these children to uh, to achieve. And then the curriculum-based assessments measure their ability to achieve those goals and target skills. So here's another video, and I, I'm not going to play this one here. It's the 14 categories of students with disability. And uh, this is within education, and autism is uh, is right here is one of them. And and I'm not gonna play this here, but um, you know, realize that that you know students with disabilities come in all different forms, all different shapes and, sh and all different shapes and sizes. Okay, now we're getting into the the thick of things here when we're talking about communication. Okay, so these students they lack uh, they lack nonverbal skills. They don't understand that communication is a two-way street. They lack joint attention, and I'll get into that a little bit more. Language development uh, uh, doesn't language development uh, doesn't keep up with their peers. Uh, some students are, are will have savant-like abilities. Um, Echolalia, as the students continues to, to repeat the same the same terms, which which may have no meaning at all over and over again. So this is all part of communication for ASD children. 
and communication to difficulties are a defining characteristic. Okay, one example is, you know, students are missing or, or lack nonverbal communication. Okay, that's eye contact, that's body language, that's smiling. Uh, these children might not understand they might not understand hand signals. Others might not be able to make eye contact. Uh, ASD children have trouble reading facial expressions. Okay? They don't understand when the teacher's mad at them or excited to see them. So it's a, it's very difficult. ASD children also struggle with joint attention. Okay, and that basically occurs when one person brings attention to an object and the other person looks at that object. So, for example, I could say, you know, look at the, uh, you know, that candle that I brought in here. You know, so I say, what do you think about this candle? And then, you know, they're not looking at the candle. They, they, there's no joint attention. Language development in, in ASD children is erratic. They just don't meet the same levels of understanding of language as their age-level peers, ASD children. And overall, there are dramatic drops and increases in abilities that occur throughout their lives. And, and when I say abilities to communicate, maybe I should have been more specific on that last one. So ASD children on the high end of the spectrum may develop savant-like abilities and talents. And... You know, in their intellectually gifted areas, these children may be able to deliver excellent, well-thought-out well speeches, okay? Because they may be savants and super talented in one area, and that is what they know, and that's what they communicate. However, that doesn't mean they can communicate in other areas. Uh, autistic children exhibit echolalia, which is a condition where sounds or phrases are repeated with no meaning or or, you know, no context to the situation. And I said it before, you know, you could be at your house and, and for no reason, you know, the, the, the ASD child might be saying red bus, red bus, red bus. Autistic children exhibit echoalia, a condition where sounds or phrases are repeated with no meaning or context to the situation. Uh, this, this does repeat here. ASD a student should, for example, continue... An ASD student may continually shout, red bus, red bus, red bus. That, that, that's repetitive. Uh, conversations are supported by, are supposed to be a two-way street. And that's why I have this street right here. Okay, conversation is supposed to be a two-way street. Uh, this is a concept ASD children uh, struggle to truly understand. Uh, the idea of social reciprocity, which is the need to keep the conversation going, doesn't always sink into their thought process. Again, they only think about their own their own understanding. It's a one-way street for them, just going up. All right, these children have special interests, okay? And, and these special interests, you know, are activities that, you know, ASD children, they, they really care about, that they're, you know, very interested in. Uh, they can be empowering, but they can also dominate their lives. And uh, let's take a look at this, all right? And take another coffee break real quick. So, uh, special interests are basically activities that ASD children pay extra attention to and engage in frequently. Special interests can also be used as a crutch when children experience anxiety. So, think about it. You know, and you know, this might be embarrassing right now. I'm, I'm going to say it. Uh, you know, talking about crutches and what, whatever, when they have anxiety. When I was a little kid, and you know, I forgot what happened. I was in my room and. I don't know, maybe one of the people living upstairs was screaming, acting nuts or something. I, I forget what it was, but I didn't want to sleep in my own room. And then I had to get, I had like this little, like warrior type penguin. And this warrior type penguin, you know, this this goes back to like Batman Returns. When, when you know, Batman was fighting the penguin and the penguin had like these little penguins with rocket launchers and things like that. I had like this little rocket launcher like type penguin. And, and you know, I would only be able to sleep with that with that little penguin. Um, because it would like reduce my anxiety, and my son has something like that too. He's he's loves Mario and Luigi and things, and he's got like a Luigi little thing that 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 he likes to have in his room when he goes to sleep. So, you know, this goes beyond ASD children. And I think we could all relate to you know, um, you know, having 
have, having a special interest or, or not really a special, let's just say a crutch that can help with anxiety. And you see here in a picture, you have a child in, in a, a child with autism spectrum disorder on the autism spectrum disorder, and they have their, their little teddy bear, which is comforting to them. Uh, so some examples of special interests include, and it could be anything, okay? It could be anything. Jewelry, credit cards, unusual things, teddy bears, toy trains, animals, baseball bats. Unfortunately, as, you know, as much as I said it was a positive, it could also be a negative, these special interests, because they can dominate the child's life. A special interests can take up all of their time, and the children remain focused on them. One positive of special interests is that they can be used for behavior modification, so, you know, you always want to turn a negative into a positive. And I don't know if this is a real negative, but, you know, if you can use it in a positive way, more power to you and to the child. So if a child behaves and completes their work, that child earns time with their special interest. You know, which maybe they earn time for, you know, the toy trains or the teddy bears. ASD children often become empowered due to the expertise and talents that develop through spending time with their special interests. And when I say they spend time with their special one second. And when I say ASD children uh, become empowered because of their expertise and, and talents, um, you know, there's going to be a, you know, there, there's a, there's a, a difference between, you know, simply liking something, like, like maybe I like to draw, and, and having drawing with, with as a special interest where that's all they want to do, okay? That, that's all they think about. So, in fact, there are many cases where ASC children use their abilities or knowledge of special interest to produce fruitful, fruitful careers and become very successful. Socialization, okay, so... Previously, we were talking about special interests. And now we're talking about socialization. So all children want friends. Um, the importance of playing has been documented uh, by uh, numerous researchers, especially behaviorists. Behaviorists love to study the importance of play, especially in rats. Um, ASD children have significant barriers to socialization and play. All children want to play and have fun. Unfortunately, ASG children have significant barriers to socialization and play. Being able to socialize isn't an easy thing to do. Um, it, it isn't an easy thing to do for many different people. It says form. I suppose say four. Uh, many non-autistic individuals have difficulties with socialization. Okay, effectively social effectively socializ socializing with others requires certain skills that are learned over periods of time and through experience okay everybody knows fitting in is always tough so you know my socialization skills have gotten better through the years you know um probably being in, in the education field meeting so many people and, and we're we're all pretty much in the education field here i think we're we're all pretty well socialized but you know there was a time uh, before i was a teacher and i was working in a lab because when i first graduated I just had a degree in biology, and I was working in the lab, and it was very lonely. And, um, you know, first of all, I didn't like to work. I was mostly just, uh, you know, just, just uh, you know, cleaning beakers and things like that. It was a, they really didn't give me much to do. And I was working for a job agency that was taking half my half my money, and I was working from 1 to 3, and then 7 to terrible hours. It was a terrible job. I'm very happy to get into teaching. I know a lot of us, uh, you know, complain about the pay, but... You know, it's not so great out there on the other side either. But um, it was very lonely. And, you know, as a teacher I, I, and in education as well, just because there's so many people you have to talk to and deal with, it, it really helps children with socialization and adults too. Uh, play is a form of socialization, and it's important for all children to experience some form of play. Uh, the Play 60 movement was created by a nonprofit with a goal uh, to engage students in at least 60 minutes of activity each day. Uh, during play, ASD children will learn teamwork, foster creativity, emotional resilience, increased cognition, physical dexterity. All these are important here. Okay, teamwork, creativity, emotional resilience, dexterity. That's all very, very important. Okay, I think as educators, we think we focus too much on the academics when there's so much more to life than just knowing how to do math and knowing, you know history or knowing you know science these are very important all right so to facilitate social skills and play educators and parents must plan activities for these children 
Educators also have the responsibility to teach other children how to act with autistic children during playtime. So you're going to work with the autistic children on how to socialize, and you have to teach the other children that, you know, this child's going to be a little different, okay? It, it's all for the good of, the, of ASD children, and it's essential to teach ASD children the perspectives of other students. ASC children usually only see their own point of view. And they have trouble understanding other points of view. All right, so metacognitive social strategies can make a tremendous difference in a child's life. These strategies, uh, these strategies enable children to think about how they are behaving socially in the context of the moment. And these children need to think about how they perceive and view social situations. Metacognitive social strategies help integrate them into society. And metacognition, let me just go over this in case you don't know, means basically thinking about thinking. You know, thinking about how you're strategizing. Thinking, it, it's like thinking about your chess strategy for a chess game. Okay? So it's like thinking about, you know, metacognitive social strategies. It's like you're thinking, how, how, how am I acting socially? You're kind of taking a step back and saying, did I do the right thing? Did I say the right thing? All right, so we're getting into the real thick of things now. So sensory processing. All right, so uh, uh, this method is used uh, to uh, perceive and respond to daily stimuli. So we're going to talk a little bit about Dunn's model and uh, sensory processing and different strategies that these children go with avoiding, uh, seeking. So these children have uh, various issues with, uh, with sensory processing, loud noises, uh, all, all this stuff. But let me get into it. Let me get into it here. We, we need more than just this infographic. All right. So sensory processing is the method used to perceive and respond to stimuli. Okay. So autism spectrum disorder children respond to stimuli in, in different ways than, you know, children without ASD. So um, we're going to focus on Dunn's model of sensory processing in, relation, in relationship to ASD. Dunn's model describes four different uh, describes different uh, neurological thresholds which in the brain called high and low, and self-regulation, active and passive. So the threshold can be either high or low, and your regulation can be active or or kind of not getting involved passive. Educators should have an understanding of this research when working with ASD students. So I have a so I'm just going to do a basic overview here of Dunn's model. So, four sensory processing patterns. Sensory seeking, low registration, sensory avoiding, and sensory sensitive. And it's very explanatory, which is great. Okay? So, let's go over them. The first pattern type of processing sensory information is called sensory seekers. Okay? These children, these sensory seekers, they seek high levels of sensory inf uh, information for stimulation. Uh, these are the children that are very active in the classroom in pursuit of sensory information. Uh, low registration. These are individuals that are insensitive. They don't register any sen They don't register any sensory information. Okay. They keep quiet into themselves. So low registration, quiet to themselves, sensory seeking. They're out there always looking for for some sort of stimulation. The third type is sensory sensitive. Uh, this type of person will notice sensory phenomena more than others. They're very sensitive to it. Uh, they're distractible in class. They question everything. They're very alert. And the last type is sensory avoiding. Uh, sensory information is irritating. It's overwhelming to these children. Okay, when they come in contact with sensory information, they have strong reactions. And you can think about, you know, some children, if you ever work with them, you know, sometimes just like wearing, walking towards them with like a bright shirt or something can cause them to sort of, you know, take a step back. It's... uh. You really, we really need to know this stuff. So here are some teaching strategies for interacting with each type of child. Uh, again, very important, right? So if 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 you're if if you're interacting with sensory seeking students, be careful bringing in new things into the classroom, as it will take their attention away and and may cause large, large disruptions. Low registration students during instructions be very clear, direct, animated with children. Because, again, low registration, the information is not going to register. So you want to be clear and direct. For sensory seeking, you don't want to bring in bright objects because, you know, the children are going to go right towards it. They're going to be drawn towards it. A sensory sensitive, don't 
don't overwhelm sensory sensitive students with unexpected events okay because you know they like a structured environment many ASD children need a structured environment so for sensory avoiding students slowly and gently try to involve these children in activities you know they're quiet volatile and mostly keep to themselves all right positive uh, uh, behavior supports okay All right. Positive behavior supports re require a positive collaborative team effort. And it begins with a functional behavioral assessment, define a behavior, gather data, uh, use ABC charts, you know, um, develop, you know, FBAs, functional behavioral assessments, are, are the basis for developing behavior plans. And then you always have to assess whatever behavior plan you have. So any type of plan. Or any type of project you do, you know, begins and ends with assessment, right? So it begins with a behavior assessment and it ends with an assessment, right? Whatever, any project, right? Whatever you do begins with an assessment and it ends with assessment. You want to know what's wrong and then you want to see if you fix that problem. So let's get into it. Positive behavior intervention and support systems can be used to help uh, mitigate inappropriate behaviors of ASD children. Um, these strategies are classroom management techniques that utilize positive motivators. Okay, we're getting away from negative, uh, you know, we're getting away from from negative punishment, which, you know, truth be told, if if you study the research, pun punishment is very effective, but it's not shown to be effective with ASD children. Uh, and altered uh, learning environments to get children to behave in a desired way. Support systems require a collaborative effort, right? I, I, I always go back to it. it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village. Don't try to do it all on your own. Don't be a hero. Ask for help, right? So here's another video. I'm going to try to link this right now in the description on positive behavior intervention and supports. Here's another video I, I made on functional behavioral assessments. Okay, one second. Okay. FBAs will help. Uh, okay, so what about functional behavioral assessments? The FBAs are to understand the why of a student's behavior. Consider the question, why is a student acting out? Educators must define the problem. The defined behavior must be both observable and measurable. And the next step is to gather data in a scientific and organized manner. Uh, data collected is in the form of intensity, frequency, and duration of the defined target. ABC charts are created with the purpose of identifying what occurs right before and directly after the targeted behavior. Educators can use ABC charts to determine what leads up to the behavior and typical reactions. Okay, so antecedent is what happens before the behavior. So you want to know what what happened before, what's causing the student to act up, and then what's the behavior, and then what consequences do, does the child have? Because sometimes the consequence is what causes the behavior as well. So if a student's acting out because he doesn't want to do work and the consequences he gets to leave the classroom and hang out with his favorite, you know, child study person, then maybe that's why they're acting out. So you want to look at what happens right before the behavior and right after the behavior. All right, so after you gather your information from the FBA charts and, and the, uh, the FBAs and the ABC charts, you create your behavior intervention plan. Any type of planning, you want to include a diverse team. So I say teachers, parents, uh, teachers aides, ABC therapists, whatever is involved in a child's life. And educators can use the BIPs as a framework for avoiding situations where these children may have an outburst. So, you know, as an educator, as a parent, anybody who works with ASD children, you want to limit, okay, you you want to limit you you want to limit their their outbursts and and you know, so, sometimes uh, their behaviors are self-inflicting. And you do that by setting and creating the proper environment for them because they really can't help themselves with their behavior. So it's on us to do what's right and set up the proper environment for them. More videos I made on ABC charts. This one's a very good one here. On the They're both short. I think two minutes. Okay. On ABC charts and behavior intervention planning. So again, everything, I, this is a common theme. Everything begins and ends in assessment. Ultimately, educators will have to assess the effectiveness of these behavior intervention plans. And if these behavior intervention plans are not successful, the team's got to make adjustments and create a new plan. All right, so now we're going to actual teaching strategies. All right, 
So first off, you want to get to know the child. Uh, create schedules, uh, use concrete objects, provide student choice. These are just some we're going to get into. Okay. There are many different teaching strategies for students with ASD. Perhaps the most important thing you can do as a teacher of these children is to get to know the child. Teachers should get to know the child's strengths, weaknesses, and triggers. Okay. Uh, find out as much as you can and then use that information to plan the best lessons possible. Here are some strategies, another video I put together for uh, teaching children with autism. Alright, I'm going to skip that. As teachers try to limit the amount of time spent on classroom lectures, don't spend all your time just talking to, to you know, lecture is, is, lecture is not the best strategy. You have to do lecture to, to an extent, but it should be no more than eight minutes. And it's funny because they say lecture should be no more than eight minutes because that's like the time children are used to watching like TV and then a commercial break. So, you know, whatever it is, uh, that's what they say. Um, but just, I, even me, I get bored sitting through lectures. So you can imagine children having to deal with this. When speaking to ASD children, be very literal in the words that you use in your conversation. And again, this is all for teachers. This is teacher strategies now. Don't be sarcastic. Uh, children don't understand. ASD children might not fully understand sarcasm. Just as, just as I said, you know, be very literal in the words you use in your conversation. Um, solid schedules are very important. Teachers should create set schedules and daily routines. And when asking questions and looking for answers, be sure to allow extra time for these children to process the information. All right, so, you know, they like to have order and you know, don't rush them. Always allow processing time. Within the classroom, limit the amount of distractions. This goes back to what we said about sensory seeking students, right? Some students may be sensory seeking and, and, and it's going to be very distracting. Very bright, very, bright, very bright posters with many colors, not a good idea. Limit any dazzling models or ornaments that are going to grab the student's attention. This is, a, this is a great tip, too. Uh, when teaching, use concrete objects when teaching abstract concepts. For example, if you're teaching math, use manipulatives to teach one-to-one -one correspondence for a counting lesson. And, and you might not understand this unless you're a math teacher, uh, but, you know, one-to-one -one correspondence is, is understanding like, like the number three means three different objects. And they understand, you know, one matches with one. Provide student choice is a great motivator for ASD students and all students. Uh, students, student choice is not only empowering, but it increases engagement. And, you know, we, earlier I talked about special interests. I did a whole section on special interests. Use their special interests. That's a great way. All right, uh, collaboration. Uh, general education teachers, special education teachers, ABA therapists, uh, case managers, uh, special education service directors, parents, Advocates, we all got to work together, okay? Everybody should work together for the benefit of the child. And this is just a, another quick infographic. Educators must be committed to the child's success. It's best for all individuals working with autism spectrum students to collaborate for the benefit of the child. Behavior therapists, school personnel um, can collaborate in the form of IEP teams, intervention teams, wraparound service teams, uh, earlier I mentioned behavior intervention plans. There's so many different teams you can create. Uh, so I'm not going to focus on just one. But uh, there should be some form of communication among individuals that are important to the ASD child. Uh, behavior at team meetings should be professional. I just wanted to put that out there as well. All right, so the first step towards successful team collaboration is that everyone develop a strong knowledge of the student. All right, uh, uh, this is collaboration for the student, so the student should be the center of attention. A team member should share any knowledge or information of the student that they have with the rest of the team. Uh, if you're, you know, part of any team for this AS, the, you know, part of a team is to share what you know. IEP behavior intervention planning must establish clear and measurable goals. All right, so whatever, you know, whatever team you or collaboration unit you formed there should be goals to it and each member has to each member has to work towards achieving that goal with the support of the team 
All right, so, uh, you know, intervention planning, IEP planning, behavior planning, all of these. So I'm not going to just focus on one because there are so many different types of collaboration. Uh, meetings should be scheduled with specific times and dates that work for all members. At these meetings, discussions should include the child's emotional state, academic strengths and weaknesses, social skills, and again, overall evaluation of services. Is the child receiving the right services? Are the services doing justice for the child? Modifications and accommodations. Major component of an IEP is development of modifications and accommodations, which are modifications are changes to the content, whereas accommodations pertain to access of content. I, a lot of people get confused with that. Um, both of these should be used to increase learning and to um, help the student uh, achieve better in the school. Again, this is a short video I made on, I'm going to skip that. So some examples of typical modifications and accommodations for ASC children include, so this is just a few of them, but believe me, there's many more. Extended time, vary the presentation, reduce work, adapting materials, preferential seating, assignment prompts, structured routines, very important. Many, many more. All right, so we're I think we're coming towards the end here, and this might be the most important one. This is the one I think about the most here. Uh, uh, the lifespan, what's it like? Uh, yeah. What's, what's it like, you know, living as an ASD children, uh, excuse me, as an ASD uh, uh, individual? And I want to get into this here. So ASD students are often the targets of bullying, and you might not think it's the case, but they are. Okay. Anybody that's different or may appear weak can be a target of bullying, and you would we would hope society's better than that, but society's not. Even high-functioning Asperger students often get bullied for the simple fact that they're just easy targets, they're different. ASD children usually lack any major social success in their adult lives as well. And when I say social success is, I mean just fitting in with the group, kind of. Um, these children don't usually form uh, life partners and do not get married. Sorry. And do not get married. Unfortunately, uh, Intimate relationships are not common among ASD children as they grow up. Lifelong friendships are hard for them to achieve. Uh, nevertheless, there are exceptions to this category, so I'm not putting down ASD children saying they can't do it, but you know, we got to be aware how difficult their life is going to be and how difficult their life is. You should know that. Long and successful careers are not very common. Adults with ASD usually settle for jobs making minimum wage with very little responsibility. It's rare for them to become managers because most of the time they're not prepared for the workforce. Again, managers need communication. So parents, teachers, and educators, try your best to prepare these children for life, life outside of school. It's going to be a difficult transition. Again, there's always exceptions where ASD children, you know, might do great, you know, within their lives. But the majority, it's going to be difficult. You know, uh, some ASD children may turn their special interests into a career and a job they love doing. Students that love film may find joy working at a movie theater. Okay, just, you know, they don't have to make movies, but maybe just working at that movie theater. Nevertheless, the most important thing here, and I put this all in cap letters because I really mean this, whether you're a teacher, a parent, whatever, the most important thing to do with, with ASC children is to stay in their lives. Don't forget about these children. Um, you might you might not understand, uh, but, you know, and, 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 and I've taught... I, 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 not not all my students were ASD, but um, more than a handful. And if I ever see them, whether it be at a shop, right, or at a game or something, I mean, they'll come running to me, Mr. Avella, Mr. Avella. And, you know, as a teacher, you mean a lot to them. And so don't forget about them. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, go with me once in a while. You know, maybe they're working at a movie theater, you know, and you're going there. Go in there, check on them, see how they're doing. Um you know they care they they have the biggest hearts all right um let's keep going here all right we're coming towards the, this is the end of the, of the presentation um all right so just this is just a quick review of all the topics this is based on, on the original video um although I added to it we talked about causes and risks okay diagnosis collaboration remember it's a communication disorder these children have special interests positive supports are great Understand sensory processing, bringing in things to the classroom. Know the different disorder types. 
you know, PDD, NOS, Asperger's. Remember, they have trouble socializing. Uh, we went over some teaching strategies that might be set, uh, might be great for them, which was you know, choice assignments and using concrete objects. Again, early intervention. I said there's much research out there about its effectiveness, and I, and I just finished up with the lifespan. Okay, so you know um, this. All right, so you know I'll I'll make this available too. Uh, all right, so uh, first off, you know, thank you for for staying through this uh, this presentation here because it's an important topic. Uh, anybody who sits through this, you know, and I, I make it. I'm always making it sound so negative. Anybody who you know comes to these trainings and, and listens to them, you're going to be a better teacher here. Um, you already are probably, you know, a, a great teacher. You know, probably a better teacher than than, than most of that that I know. Include, you know, even me. You know, I, I, you know, struggle sometimes, and you know, I don't want to go and, and and advance myself. But you know, uh, thank you for staying. I appreciate it. Remember, we're all a family of educators. I said, you know, I started off with, you know, together we make a family of educators. We're all a family here. We got to help each other out, and uh, you know, we got to keep trucking, keep moving forward. So again, uh, thank you. And I'm going to wrap this up here. I'll see you for the, the next one uh, coming up soon.